Osiris. Hey there, this is Maggie Rose, recording artist and host of Salute the Songbird with Osiris Media, and I'm here to tell you about a product that I've fallen in love with. I use it out on the road, and I use it when I'm at home, and I'm talking about Upsy CBD products. Upsy is a personal wellness mission focused on curating products made from honest, pure, organic ingredients that are designed to support everyday people improve their performance and overall quality of life. Grown in Kentucky, Upsy products are non-GMO, THC-free, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher. Products range from pain relief topicals, on-the-go beverage blends, and tinctures. I personally use the Align Tincture every morning to support homeostasis by helping balance mood, ease stress, and calm anxiety. Available in 500, 1,000, and 1,500 milligram mint. I also love the beverage blend Lift. Provides clean, burning energy to power you through all of life's adventures without a crash. Each packet of our on-the-go drink mix contains 20 milligrams of pure CBD isolate, 100 milligrams of theanine and amino acid, which supports focus, and 150 milligrams of caffeine. That definitely gets me going. Life demands a superhero. You deserve a sidekick. It is 100% organic, 0% THC, lab-tested, and verified. 100% vegan and made in the USA. Visit upsy.com and use the code SONGBIRD at checkout to receive 30% off your order today. I think the fact that, you know, I can't help myself in my writing and in my personhood, you know, just sort of like, if there needs to be a heavy part here, there's going to be a heavy part here. If there's going to be a jam here, there's going to be a jam here. If I'm writing like sugary, sweet, like saccharin, pop music that's because i love that shit you know what i mean i'm like it's just sort of a grand like picture of who i am you know and i'm i wish i was sometimes i wish i was more unilateral because it's an easier sell and it's an easier concept you know what i mean as opposed to like shit like i really do a lot of stuff here and like i don't know it's like not that it's not a clear vision it's just that that's who i am i feel like Hi, this is Maggie Rose. You're listening to Salute the Songbird on Osiris Media. Salute the Songbird is a platform for women in music to share their stories and let their voices be heard. And everyone has a seat at the table. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Salute the Songbird. I'm your host, Maggie Rose. And just like every episode, I'm obviously thrilled to speak with my guest, but today is very exciting because I have not had the chance to personally yet meet Karina Reichman, but I've been seeing her name all over the place and we keep getting added on the same festivals. We're playing Peach Fest together. David Shaw of The Revivalist put a festival together that we're both on. We're playing Bonnaroo together. And she's so exciting to me because she's an incredibly accomplished musician, but she transcends genre in an epic way. She lives in the jam world. She plays as a bassist in Marco Benevento's band. She's open for the likes of Wolfpack, Dispatch, the Claypool Lennon Delirium, Guster. Her favorite band is Ween. In fact, the night that we spoke, she was going to one of their shows. She is just someone who's so excited and stimulated by what she's doing in music, and it shows. She grew up in New York City, near the Beacon Theater, one of my favorite spots ever. And when she was very young, like 13 years old, she was finding a way to pay for and attend every Allman Brothers show that was happening at the Beacon Theater. 
which is not the behavior of your typical 13 year old. And we talk a little bit in our conversation about how she managed to pull that off. But she was going to study her favorite musicians. She called these clinics. She wasn't going to party or rebel against her parents, although in her words, she danced her ass off and celebrated life. But she tells me about having broad musical ears, which is a term that I've totally hijacked from Karina because I love what it means. It's describing an audience who just loves good music and doesn't confine you to one genre. And she tells me about how having those broad musical ears helped her become such a versatile musician. She possesses not only creative chops, but technical proficiency. And we discuss how she applies that in the studio, especially as it pertains to her forthcoming solo debut album. She shares some wisdom from one of her mentors that helps her deal with imposter syndrome. Also shares with me some of the best songwriting advice from a mentor of hers as well. Listening to Karina both in this interview as a conversationalist and listening to her music is so grounding and refreshing. She's had some incredible experiences and played with some of the world's best musicians, and she is genuinely awed by it all. And I know that she will awe you as well. Here is my new friend, Karina Reichman. I've seen you on Peach Fest. We're doing uh, David Shaw's show together, and I've just been seeing your name everywhere and listening to interviews of yours and like you just have such a wonderful energy thank you for the kind words and i've seen you on all the stuff too and i'm like wait when do i get to meet her like what's going on but i'm glad we can you know meet virtually before we meet at a festival or something i know this is just gonna make it that much easier at montage mountain to just get right to the good stuff right, right away. to the good stuff we'll so take the good. ski lift together to the top of the mountain and I love that. Have you been there to that venue? Uh, Yeah, yeah, certainly. Certainly. With Marco? I played it last year. No, I played it with my band last year. It was like sort of like the biggest, it was a big show for my band. They gave us like a really sweet slot, but on the smallest stage, but it was like, it was a big party. So uh, I played it then, but then I'd I'd been attending that fest, like just as a fan for years. Like I've probably been to at least four maybe five peach fests like before that just as a fan so that's so awesome that's such a great segue into just introducing you to the salute the songbird audience because i just heard all these great interviews about you talking about your childhood growing up in manhattan and you're not a transplant like you are born and bred in the city and i love the stories of how you kind of scrounge together funds to go to to Almond Brothers shows and how did you um become so resourceful and tell me about your childhood in New York City and just your proximity to music in my youth I like all throughout high school I just got really obsessed with seeing the Almond Brothers band cuz I grew up like 20 blocks away from the beacon and my school was like 5 blocks away from the beacon and it was a uh, it was just a thing you know and I just got completely obsessed with it and uh I, I, I had to go every night. It was like a compulsion. And this is at 13 years old. That's pretty unique. Yeah, 13, 14, 15, like all of that, all of that. And I went to all 10 shows. Yeah, and nobody, you know, it's not like I had like a ton of friends my age who like understood why I was doing that. You know, I had a few <laughs> went, that we would go like together and whatnot. But like for the most part, like the kids in school were like certainly not listening to like all of that. But, uh, but yeah, in terms of being resourceful, I, uh, for, for, for the listeners, I, this is bad. It was very bad. It was not a good thing to do, but like my parents had a chest sort of a foreign currency that like, you know, my dad would like go on business trips and like come back and like, you know, put like, you know, some Brazilian dollars or some euros or like whatever it was like in this thing. And like, I just started sort of just skimming a little off the top and then right. going down to 42nd street to the currency exchange place and like turning it into American dollars and then going back up and then giving it to a scalper and just like getting in the door, you know, and that is not, I don't condone that for, um, for, for young people listening. You probably shouldn't do that. And they had no idea for years that I did that. And then like years later, they, uh, you know, they, they were like going to, on a trip or something they're like karina like where are the euros right like, like this is actually money karina 
you're right. And I was like, Ooh, and I came clean and it was, uh, it was, it was, uh, not, not pretty for a half a second there. It was, it, it's okay. But then it's all good. Now we all, uh, we all learned something there. I got to see, you know, 60 Almond Brothers shows or whatever. And, uh, yeah, that was just, that was one of the many things that I loved in a, in a huge way. And it was every March, you know, but growing up in the city was, you know, the best thing, you know, ever for me, I just kind of, you know, found my posse and we like took advantage of it in the biggest way. I fell in love with live music and fell in love with music in general around sort of that age, like 12, 13, I started playing guitar and then it all was just like, Oh, like this is something I am completely transfixed by, you know? And then next thing you know, I'm in a band, then I'm in two bands, then I'm in five bands. They're all, you know, scrappy going to, you know, play like Dawn Hills was a club and like the knitting factory when it was still in Manhattan. And when you live here, you know, there's a lot going on and a lot that you can choose to take in or not. And I, I certainly, I certainly chose to <laughs> and tried to be everywhere. But I think you followed through with that too. I mean, obviously the self-sufficiency that you have to have as a 13 year old to just be able to get yourself to a concert. Like I'm, I don't think I could have navigated that. I think that speaks volumes just about who you are, but then also the compartmentalization you were able to balance by being in all these different bands. I think that's expressed in what you're doing today. And just the fact that you do transcend a lot of genres and you can exist in all these different spaces and comfortably. So like, was that part of the grand design or is that just, you think your most authentic expression of you? <laughs> Probably the latter, just because I'm I'm so I'm like to a fault. I like too many styles of music. Like I'm extreme. I just have super broad ears. You know, I love heavy metal. You know, I grew up playing punk and metal and like really like harder stuff. But I also was in the jazz band, you know, and I love jazz and I love, you know, singer songwriters, soft, like, you know, from the heaviest of heavy to the softest of soft, intense compositions and whatever to like three chords and the truth, all of it, like sure. all of it, you know? So at the same time as going to see, I've now seen like 110 fish shows and I started yeah. at age 15, you know, and I'm 28. So yeah, seeing fish, seeing the almonds, that's like a huge part of my life. But I was also like following Nine Inch Nails around and I was seeing, you know, Metallica and Slayer and Megadeth and like, you know, just to like put like a polar opposite side of the spectrum, you know, musically. I'm obsessed with Beck. Beck is one of my favorite yeah. songwriters alive, you know, and I don't know, I was seeing all kinds of music that just ran the gamut, if you will, you know? So I think the fact that, you know, I can't help myself in my writing and in my personhood, you know, just sort of like, if there needs to be a heavy part here, there's going to be a heavy part here. If there's going to be a jam here, there's going to be a jam here. If I'm writing like sugary, sweet, like saccharine pop music, that's because I love that shit. You know what I mean? I'm like, it's just sort of a grand like picture of who I am, you know? And I'm, I wish I was... Sometimes I wish I was more unilateral because it's an easier sell and it's an easier concept. You know what I mean? Totally. As opposed to like, shit, like I really do a lot of stuff here. And like, I don't know. It's like not that it's not a clear vision. It's just that that's who I am, I feel like. So I'm working real hard on my new record. Super exciting. So right now I'm thinking about all these things and like what what's this, you know, general picture look like in terms of like, this is my first record what's it look like when you wrap it all up in a bow and you don't just like put singles out. Right. Right. And now I see a clear picture of, of what it is. Whereas like when I was in the thick of it, sometimes I was like, Oh shit. Like, is this like all over the place? Like, is this not yeah. focused enough? But now I don't feel that way at all. Now I don't feel that way at all. Now it's, it's indie pop rock drenched in psychedelia with all kinds of crazy moments and, you know, big bass moments, big guitar moments, but you know, all, all of that. And big vocal moments. I heard you kind of reference. Yeah. I'm singing, I'm singing, I'm singing on all, but, uh, all but one, which is wild. You know, it's, it doesn't come naturally to me, but I'm, I'm working on it. I'm definitely working on it.
feel like I've shared that similar, not problem, but just obstacle of like, am I just like so confused about, or am I confusing the audience and trying to entertain all these different sides of your musicianship? But it's like, if you can, and it's authentic to you, then usually that's what makes for the most sustainable acts because like Peach Fest to me is such a great example of when I arrived there uh, in 2018, it was the first and only time I played it. I was like, I didn't consider myself to be a jam artist by any means, but it's this community is kind of what I think of it as more is just, you know, they are discerning, a very discerning audience, but they're loving and welcoming. And like, if you want to improvise and, you know, play every song for that audience. And I think you can live in that space, but that means you have to be flexible. And I think you should be that way with what you're writing and recording. So I get that, but that usually means that you're capable if you feel like you're trying to figure that out. Definitely. And that, yeah, like you say, the jam, the jam sphere, if you will, is such a sort of amazing one to be embraced by because I think they have the widest ears in any sort of sphere. I think the jam folk, generally speaking, like, you know, you can you can get heavy and then you can get jazzy and you can get all of these sorts of things. You know, if you look at a band like Fish or they're they're genre fluid like when I think about my own stuff, I'm like, come on, like, l listen to this band, Fish. Like, they do so many different things and they're wildly embraced. And you see that in sort of these different permutations of the jam sort of world, you know, and these fans that are just, um, I don't know, I think they have really wide ears. And I totally. really appreciate that about them. And like you say, if you look at the Peach lineup, like, I don't know, you have the Whalers and then you have Raylan Baxter and you have you yeah. and you have me and you have like, you know. Obviously, Billy Strings is has straddled, you know, way beyond the, oh the jam sphere. But yeah. you know, uh, it's it's just cool, like something like that. That like you know, we have we have all these sort of different worlds. Yeah, Solis, who like yeah, he can jam. Speaking of, and now she's just kind totally. of totally emerging and blowing up with her own stuff. That's a great way to describe it is with wide ears, and it's not like they're just like oh whatever, we'll take anybody. But I do think that they can appreciate the levity of one song right next to like a really heavy song that can be heavy and emotional without any lyrics at all. Like there's just, so what is the process in the studio looked like for you? Like how was making this record? It's been going on for a long time, but I'm very, um, I'm, I'm very blessed to work with my dear friend and producer, a gentleman named Gabe Monroe, who is really sort of my right hand man in all of this. And we write together and he produces me and we just, he has as wide ears as I do, you know, and we grew up together, know each other since high school. And he's a nasty producer and an incredible bass player. He plays circles around anybody I know really like, you know, so I don't know. We, we really speak the same language and uh, he and I wrote, basically wrote this whole record together with a few exceptions of like, you know, a few things that my band and I wrote together or stuff that I brought to the band or whatever. Um, uh, but basically it's, it's almost a hundred percent me and Gabe and just, you know, basically coming in with an open mind and me being like, this is what is exciting me today. This is what I want to go for today. And basically just churning out what, what we refer to as seedlings, you know, just like little demos, usually, in fact, always, I shouldn't say usually, always instrumental at first. I never come in with a lyrical concept first. That always comes second for whatever reason, but probably because I'm not a singer, but, um, you know, and we, uh, and we just churn out seedling after seedling after seedling after seedling. And just, you know, I, there are some where like right off the bat, I'm like, oh, there's a vibe here. This is something, this will become something, you know? And the ones that I keep going back and listening to, I know that they deserve my time. You know what I mean? I know that I need to expound upon that idea. Otherwise they, you know, and when they fall by the wayside, they should fall by the wayside. You know what I mean? If they can't hold my attention, they're not going to hold yours, you know, which isn't fully the point of doing any of this, but still I did like, even for me, like, why would I work on something that I'm just like, eh, that one's all right. But like, what, you know, 
Um, and then, you know, pick your seedling, come up with vocal melody. If we're doing, if we're, you know, if we're doing vocals here, or, you know, I, I have been, so get that guy going. And then basically like, I like to like come up with the vocal melody, either on like a keyboard or a synthesizer or a guitar for the most part. And just like, it's almost like I'm soloing really slowly over these things and just trying to come up with melodic lines and whatnot. And then, uh, and then eventually some of those stick and then uh, come the words and then, you know, basically just suffering and architecting, you know, these little things over and over and over until um, I'm happy or at least, you know, almost happy <laughs> with, you know, cause uh, we're never, we're never done. Right, Maggie. Yeah. No, you're never. We're never. <laughs> no, and it's, it's maddening, really. But I guess maddening. Ugh. It's your baby is ripped from your arms at some point, and you just have to watch it go live. Yeah, its awesome have to life. let it go. That's a totally it. And they are songs are like you know children, right? Where it's like after a certain point, it's not even mine anymore. After a certain yeah, point, we cast it off. It has its own life. That's this is just it's a part of me, but it's a part of everybody, right? right? So that's basically the, that's been the process. And then once that all comes together, right, you know, seedling wise words, all these things, then, you know, let's say there's like electronic drum production, right. Then I'll bring my drummer in and he'll record real analog drums along to that. And same with guitars and same with bass and same with synths and like whatever I'm doing, basically like, you know, making it in the box. So they say, and then layering in all these things sort of, on top of that and then replacing piece by piece the electronic with the analog and then often hybridizing both which appeals to me in a big way i like both sort of schools of thought in a lot of ways but uh obviously i mean you know i also like my stuff to like you know breathe with sort of analog outboard gear and whatever you know so having both having both to me is is for me awesome i feel like it would be so awesome to just watch you in the studio because you just have such a command over of course your artistic side but the technical side like you have the awareness of all this gear and what it does from a production standpoint so did you co-produce this record i mean you could certainly say that in the sense that you know i was i was with gabe every step of the way and like we both know like yeah and i'll be like this needs a a delay send this needs a you know like this needs to be twice as wet as that or like you know like Yeah, like we certainly nitpicked over it in a producer-esque way, but I'll tell you, like he is a genius with like the manipulation of the software and the and everything, you know, which I have very little actual skill uh, with, you know. But we're we're both we're taking it um, to be mixed by I can't I can't say who yet, I can't say where yet, but it's all very exciting and I'm wildly stoked about it and uh, and that's where you know a lot of the stuff that we've done we're gonna reamp it, you know, and we're gonna make it breathe through these analog outboard things that like you know which we've been doing in part Mm -hmm. at our studio but not fully and like this will be good to just get it out of our ears and into somebody who hasn't had their nose on it for the last you know million years for sure oh my gosh just a fresh perspective is invaluable right? oh, it was oh very refreshing because i'm coming to you from nashville where like lyrics and like people are jotting down titles in their phones at three in the morning like there's always seemingly sure. the origin coming from like this kind of more lyric melody driven place But I loved how you said, like, if it's not holding my attention, it certainly won't hold or captivate an audience's attention. You can get ahead of yourself with having a concept before an actual, like, vibe, like you're saying. And people don't realize, like, you have one great song, but there was probably dozens of attempts to just get the origins of that rolling. It's just getting the ball rolling is so intangible. It feels that, like, is the hardest thing to be able to identify and then you're in it and you're like oh my god it's happening but it just takes a second and i think people don't realize this one song is a product of many many efforts oh and many things that get thrown away in the process right like just like tossing ones that aren't aren't it you know and like r.i.p to those songs right (laughs) songs that never is you know I, i but you know it takes a lot of those to get to the ones that you 
feel compelled by, I feel like, you know. Well, little pieces of them might resurface in other works, but I think being a good editor is just as important as being a good writer or a good artist or knowing like what kind of sound you're looking for. I definitely am one of those people who has like, you know, the, my mm -hmm. voice recorder and like just the note app on my phone. Like I am always scribbling down words and sure. lines that compel me totally. Yeah. But it's, they're, they're sort of like archived, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like I just have like endless things, like things I think are funny or like, you know, interesting or like whatever, just like lines that go well together. Or so I think at three in the morning. Right. And like, yeah. and I'll, I'll comb through those once I get my musical vibe you know what i mean like they i definitely am sensitive to words in a big way in a mm -hmm. really big way such that like you know and I, i'm not like you know some jim morrison lyricist on any level but i'm definitely like it's not just like oh great words like yeah let's put some down there like cool you know i'm definitely always like kind of culling together this sort of like you know web of things that uh you know word wise uh compel me Sure. I mean, that's apparent, but I think that it's just, you always kind of hear about, well, I had a concept and I think that it's intimidating to people who don't ever, or haven't even ever attempted to write a song. Cause it's just like, oh, well, it's that easy. And it's really not. I mean, right. You're just chasing and chasing and chasing until you feel. And I think songs should take many days to be completed as well. Many, maybe weeks, maybe you set it aside and it, summons you back i have a, a mentor who said something very interesting to me like in, on the level of of words where he says words are everything but you don't have to say anything important <laughs> and i love that because i feel like we do get kind of caught up i don't know like i get caught up being like this has to be profound even like in some way, you know what I mean? Like I have to speak some kind of truth here. That's just like, yo, like people are going to be like, whoa, but that's right. not true. You know? <laughs> and it's just like an interesting thought there that like, I don't know, that liberated me as a sort of fearful songwriter, if anything, you know, as somebody who's just like, oh shit, like, is this good enough? Is this dope enough? Is this riff sick? Like, you know, like all of that, I definitely like scrutinize the shit a lot, you know, and that, that helped somehow. So I love that. No, that helps me too. I, it's comforting because I think it's back to your point about just the jam sphere, um, in particular, the wide ears aspect of it, of, you know, we need those comical moments. Speaking of fish, I mean, they have songs that are just funny, like, Oh yeah. The tires are the things on your car that like, you know, we're singing that. And then they have stuff from Sigma Oasis that makes you cry and, we're given Absolutely. that in the middle of a pandemic. So I think that little adage that your mentor gave you is it's like it all has to come together. The feeling and the lyrics and the music have to match. And sometimes that might not call for an earth shattering lyric. You might need something easy and colloquial or something. Absolutely. Yeah. And how many great songs are there that are just like, you know, about something so random you know what i mean like right. it's just like wow why would you ever wow and and it's great you know yeah, like sucking on chili dogs <laughs> like 100 percent, or like you know you put the lamb in the coconut oh you my shake God. it all up like it's a fucking brilliant but it's that song. chord like, it's just like the one chord that song totally and it's You're so right. great he had, and he had to be you know nilson was sitting there being like i got it it's called yeah. coconut Hey guys, it's Maggie. I hope you're enjoying my conversation with Karina. I'm actually out in my backyard right now, enjoying a little gardening and a moment at home. My bus rolled in at 3 a.m. this morning, but we leave again very soon. So I'm trying to get all my plants in the ground and do what I gotta do before we hit the road again. But when I spoke with Karina, it was a Sunday and I was feeling more tired than I am right now, albeit thankful, but I'd just gotten done a long string of shows and Sunday is our day to kind of do laundry and reset and get after it. So I was so excited to speak with her, but I was dragging and 
I feel like it was a godsend having her be my guest that day because she just lit a fire under my ass, for lack of a better phrase. I love how confident she is and that she knows who she is and what music she wants to make and even more importantly, what her place within music is. And we have a lot of similarities in that regard. She doesn't question, you know, us kind of wandering into different territories that people may have not expected for us initially, but she owns it. And that was really inspiring. So I am so thankful to have Karina's energy rub off on me today, that Sunday when I first talked to her. I cannot wait to see her out on the road. And I hope that, you know, she's having that same effect on you guys as well and that we all get to go celebrate some live music together soon. Happy gardening. Back to Karina. Well, so, okay, tonight you said you're going to see Ween, which I think is really awesome because you've played for Marco for, what, since 2016? You replaced Dave from Ween in Marco's band. And now you're going to celebrate their music. And I just feel like what I've noticed from watching your career and just you blowing up in all these spaces is there's this genuine love for Karina Reichman from all of these people and just mad respect that seems very authentic. And you are in a unique position, just being as young as you are, being a woman, like fronting your own band, but also holding down this fundamental part of the rhythm section. Do you feel like you're in a unique position or does this just all feel totally like organic and exactly where you should be? Number one, like, you know, sometimes just so it's all so surreal, especially when you look at, you know, what's happened like with Ween and and Dave and all of that. And like, talk about like, he's my, my, you know, such a huge mentor to me and like, you know, has known me since I was 16 and put me in that sort of position that completely changed everything. I'm, I'm a massive Ween fan. I know every single Ween song. I was there on Friday as well. Uh, and, and, you know, sitting in like one of these little booths, you know, on the side and, you know, all these people are just like, she knows every song. How does she know it? Karina, what song, what's this called? What's this called? When did this come out? When was their last record? What was this? I'm like, I'm a, I'm a ween encyclopedia. What that band means to me on talk about just like, <laughs> you know, singing about whatever. And like the most compelling, beautiful, heart wrenching songs and the most hilarious and the most off color and the most genre fluid band I would argue of all time, you know, just shifting from, you know, complete madness to complete beauty and all that stuff. But I can't speak enough about weed. All I'm saying is, uh, you know, it's sort of an intangible, crazy thing that I've been put in these kind of amazing positions, you know, but just it's all you know, just putting one step in front of the other sort of, and just like doing exactly what I thought was, you know, the, the right thing at that moment when things were presented to me, like they could have easily said that to me. And I would have been like, dude, no, I'm going to work in the music business. I, you know, I have a salary. I I have a job. I'm finishing up NYU is too much for me. You know what I mean? Like I basically said yes at right. times when, and I put a shit ton of work in, especially for that, that meant so much to me when I got the Marco gig and I had to fill in for, you know, the basis of my favorite band and also not, you know, it can't be overstated how incredible of a human Dave Drywitz is. And he's one of the most incredible people. Anyone would tell you that, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not a unique, uh, you know, uh, position to have on the guy, but you know, just wanting to do so well by him and well by Marco and knowing that like being 22 and being put in that position was a huge deal. Like, and is. Just to clarify, Dave facilitated this opportunity for you with Marco and his band. Right. A hundred percent. With Marco having never heard me play a note, not one. You know, I was not, I was nothing. I, 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 I was in five bands going nowhere, like playing locally here, you know, and like, loving every second of it, but like there was not a clear 
path forward for me being a professional musician at that mm-hmm. moment. I was also at NYU. I was studying. I was writing my, oh my thesis. God. Like I had, I had a full time job at a concert promoter. Like you know, settling shows and doing you know sending offers. I was doing all kinds of crazy stuff at that time. You're like, I'll be music adjacent, damn it. Like I'm going to be close to it regardless. What, whatever it was, I didn't care. I didn't care. I was going to be close to it whether I was on stage or not. And that mattered most to me. And I, I knew that from the very beginning, but that's, that's sort of on the level of what you're talking about. Like, does it feel organic and natural or does it feel like holy fucking shit like i'm in such a unique position it 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 feels sort of like both just because i think having that sort of very clear desire to be around and in music in whatever way shape or form from a very 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 young age i would argue and being the exact same person i was at 15 Still at 28, I really feel like I have been, I, I care about the same things. I, my humor hasn't changed. My taste in food hasn't changed. My musical channel, like I really am just that. I'm that guy, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm like, dude. So when they say like, you know, be childlike, not childish. Like I just have this like overwhelming enthusiasm for this shit. Mm-hmm. And every weird step of the way that has taken me to right now, where I'm like making my first solo record, which I think is like something I never thought I would do. Never. If you ask me, you know, I'm also super realistic in just in life. You know what I mean? I'm not, I, and that's why I was like, oh, there's no clear path forward for me being a professional musician. I'm going to do the thing I'm doing right now, you know, like, cause there is a clear path forward here. So this is a long winded way of me saying like, it's, it's such a combination of, of all those things, but knowing what I wanted when I wanted it and following sort of the the lines that led me here and just saying yes to opportunities and putting a fuck ton of work when those opportunities came to be and, and whatnot. It just, it all sort of, it does feel organic in so many ways, but it also feels absolutely overwhelming and surreal at others, right. you know, and, and it's, it's a combination and it's both a huge fucking deal and it's nothing. listening to interviews that you had given like I'm walking outside it's a beautiful day and I'm listening to you and your philosophy about music and just like this really well-adjusted artist who's taking all these things in stride and I know that like of course you said it can be overwhelming sometimes but your attitude about being a creative and all this just feels like really healthy and it made me feel healthier too because you're like we it, we can only just do our best work and get in where we fit in and you know be ourselves and I, like whatever that looks like now people have more examples like you to look to like a young girl who wants to be a bass player who wants to live in this space and they are few and far between and like i was listening to you talk about a lot of your influences you know, like Bootsy Collins and Phil Lesh and like all these incredible bass players, but they're all, they're all men. And um, they're all dudes. They're all, and they're all exceptionally talented dudes, but like, it's going to be just cool to have Karina Reichman be among the list years from now when girls are on their own podcast doing the same exciting kind of stuff. So oh, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. There's Tina Weymouth. She's the, she's the, the, the big one. Bless her. You know? She oh yeah. The torch. I mean, Kathy Valentine started off as a guitar player and is like an incredible, she's been on this podcast and she was just like, well, they needed a bass player. So I just started playing bass. Like, how did you graduate? Just from, like that. Was it the Marco <laughs> gig that made you basically like, okay, well I'm a bass player now and I'm going to be super serious about it. Like that's when I got serious about it as opposed to kind of flipping around between bass and guitar. Uh, Certainly. But even before that, like much like, much like she said, I, you know, it was sort of like back in high school, it was like, Oh, we need somebody to play bass. I'm like, Oh, I got that. It's just for like, I got that. Right. And just doing it sort of out of necessity and then loving it. And I've also, I love, 
I love the bass. I've grown and, and I always have, you know, in terms of just like what it does sonically. I oh, like yeah. low end, you know, I'm definitely it wasn't uh, it wasn't a hard sell for me <laughs> right. at any point. What's your favorite part about being the bass player in Marco's band? Well, being the bass player in Marco's band is is awesome on many many levels because it's like uh, got a little pocket of groove for you to just hang out in all the time. Totally. So well, funky. I like I love I love that I get to play like you know his band's a trio and my band's a trio, which oh, cool. means that we all have to sort of occupy. You know, it, we're we're both trios that you know want to sound like arena rock bands you know mm-hmm. what I mean? yeah so you know we're trios that aren't trying to sound like jazz trios for the most part so kind of filling a lot of space and occupying sort of a lot of sonic range and dimensions if that makes right. sense and with with marco also while doing that also knowing that he's beyond virtuosic at what he does and just you know the amount of things he has going on in his world over there like he's triggering things with his feet and then one you know yeah a million synthesizers and and things and tracks and you know i I, you can't even keep track of what that guy's doing over there and the two hands doing a million things like he's really like an octopus an exceptional (laughs) octopus yes exactly so while I often have room to explore a lot of space as a bass player who usually, you know, they, we usually just stick to one thing and, and, you know, keep it simple. I, you're holding I it down. Definitely have, I'm holding it down for sure. And letting him sort of dance around me a lot of the time. And then sometimes I come out and we kind of have this crazy, like, you know, dance, see interplay going on uh, with our two instruments and, that's that's really cool. So I don't know, just having having the ability to do both, I think, is is the coolest thing. And also just playing with somebody who's so completely effervescent and full of joy mm. too, on and off stage. He's an incredible dude. Like, I know so many people ask you about this because in the jam scene, people are like, oh, these, like, people who don't know anything about it, there's, like, a whole sober community in there, and there's people who aren't sober, and, like, it all just works out. But, like, you never got into, you know, drinking and drugs in any way in the music industry. You just kind of knew as a young person to avoid that. And, like, how did you get pointed in the right direction just to like be like nope i'm just gonna stay on this fast track to success Um, i mean you know i certainly never conceptualized it like like it was a fast track to success but more just like i just didn't want to especially when i was like in high school i was like i don't want to be that girl sort of who's just like all the 13 year old going to yeah like and it was too it was too important to me you know what i mean like and like going to see the musicians i loved like they were it was you know don't get me wrong i'm dancing my ass off right really like you know i was celebrating life don't get me wrong (laughs) but they were clinic they were clinics to me as well you know what i mean and it's kind of this sort of straddled balance between studying what's going on in a very sort of you know, both anthropological and just like, you know, musicology kind of way, you know, just like what is happening and why and in this place and time and the interplay and like, you know, seeing obviously a ton of jam bands, but seeing a ton of all kinds of, you know, different music and seeing what that all kind of means and the places that they and spaces they occupied and whatnot. Um, So I don't know, for me, just like, you know, in high school, I never drank, I never, you know, I've never done drugs, but I, you know, one thing that I'll say is I'm certain, like, you know, I definitely, I barely drink, mm-hmm. but I'm not, I wouldn't refer to myself as sober, you right, know, right. like I drink once in a blue moon. If I feel compelled to, I love tequila after mm-hmm. a good show, same, same. you know, yeah. that's just great. Like I'm not, I'm certainly not presenting myself as like, you know, like I'm like a sober person 
Yeah, you don't feel bound to this title or... or No. Yeah, sure. And I think that that can be one of the most daunting things about it for so many people is like, I'm part of this tribe or I'm part of this tribe. And like people just have so much trouble with moderation. And seemingly music and consumption just goes together. And then totally. I'm sure that's why I was like, do I even want to ask her? Because I feel like I hear you get asked that a lot. But it's because it's interesting and it's not the norm. I mean, it's like sure. almost an expectation. It's a prerequisite as for some people's ideas of a musician. And you are living proof that that's just not the case. Well, 100 percent. Like it's yeah, that's like I feel much like in my sort of, you know, choices to to not do stuff. Like mm-hmm. there's also like I don't like you say, like, you know. It's a fluidity. To I it. also, yeah, once in a while, if I'm having a whatever kind of eat, like, you know, in New Orleans, I love drinking in New Orleans. It's yeah. fucking fabulous. You know what I mean? And that means, like, if I need to play until six in the morning, where usually that's what I'm doing down there. Sure. Like, tequila and espresso will carry me through, <laughs> right. but that's it. You know, That'll like, do that's, it. <laughs> that's, that's the cocktail of life for me right there. Uh-huh. Like, you know, and, uh, and yeah, no, in terms of the other stuff, I just, I, I feel a very strong sort of self-preservation mentality within me, you know, which I think I get from my You're mother. Highly visible. Well, sure. Right. Yeah. And just like also not want, like literally not wanting to be sick, not wanting to be fucked up. And when I say fucked up, I don't mean like fucked up on drugs. I just mean literally like fucked up. You know what I mean? Like, you, you know, wake up in the morning and feel like shit, I have too much to do. Like, I, I don't want that feeling, you know? And I don't know. I I always feel like I have to take care of myself because I like want to take care of myself, which some people don't feel that way, you know, totally reasonable. (laughs) Um, Someone who has as many tour dates as you coming up, it's like stamina is important. All of that. I owe it to myself to not undermine my cognitive abilities, you know, know, want to in front of a bunch of people. Want to try, want to try, you know, and uh, yeah, Yeah. sort of that's, that's, uh, that's sort of how I, conceive of it for the most part is just trying to like you know you you you, you pick your battles once in a while if it's the if if it's calling to me like i'm in but i haven't had a drink since right. the end of september and i'm it's not like i'm counting i just realized that that was the day that i like that was it you know i was like oh, like, oh it just occurred to me that yeah, yeah. and not because i'm like that's well, i have however many months sober like it, that's not how i feel about it i just i'm like wow that's really interesting i just i have not been compelled to have a drink since then. Like nothing's called to me in all those months. And that includes an all inclusive, you know, vacation in Mexico playing with the disco biscuits and like Miami festival and playing three nights in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where they go crazy with Marco. Like I've had gigs, you know, (laughs) plenty of opportunities, but for sure. The other thing while we're on the subject, I um, not only do I play a lot of gigs, like I say, I love, going to see live music like seeing live music is my shit i have an opportunity to go out to plenty of shows I, but just i'm not going to say as much as i want and this doesn't i hope it doesn't come off as like anything other than just honest but just the truth but like if you use every show that you go to as an opportunity to drink but you go out seven nights a week then when are you not drinking mm-hmm. i don't want to drink every night of the week it makes right. you feel like shit like you know like when you already said you use these these experiences as clinics too to become a better musician you're there to study that's one of the best reasons to live in nashville or new york like there's great music happening tonight just i live in east nashville probably at the beast and i want to go out because i want to be in proximity with all these great artists but i had to do an examination like that too just like even if you're having one cocktail every time you go out, your sleep gets messed up. Like your voice is going to eventually oh, yeah. take a hit. Like it's just, it's just growing and recalibrating and deciding like how badly do you want to do this forever and being aware of habits that you're developing just by being in the business and you don't want it to be occupational hazards. I just want everybody to find what works for them and leave everybody else alone, you know? So for me, I feel like being yeah. mostly just straight and narrow on all that stuff with the occasional, hey, who knows? What's going to, you know, right. maybe a little tequila tonight, yeah. which will be, you know, everyone will know. You know what I mean? 
<laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> if I have one tequila beverage, you could tell I'm a very wound up. Uh, <laughs> you know. Right. I can't even imagine you after having tequila. I'm a nut. I would, I'm a nut. I'd love to see that. It's wildly entertaining. Because you already have so much energy. I have more energy than any human has a right I'm to. I'm sure you're a blast. <laughs> What's your favorite part about being a woman in the music industry? Everything. (laughs) I like surprising a motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? I like creeping up. (laughs) I like pulling up to the club. You know, they tell me the merch table's over there. And I say, I don't fucking think so. That's not where I'm going. You know what I'm saying? That's not where I'm going. I'm going over there. And then they're like, oh, shit. (laughs) And then the show happens. Uh Uh, you know, I mean, Ooh, yeah, I love that's, that. That's a good answer right there. But really, I mean, you know, it's, uh, as you say, not a road paved by a ton of other women, unfortunately. That's why we need to, you know, stick together and, you know, be good to one another and like, you know, just celebrate womanhood among musicians. Like it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And there should be more of us. There should be more female instrumentalists. Like, like you say, like, I hope, younger you know girls are like learning instruments and making it happen and just like finding joy through music it's such an incredible like I just hope you know anybody you know what they say they say if you can feel what I'm feeling then it's a musical masterpiece and I believe that (laughs) and uh you know yeah just it's it's obviously uh, a different space to occupy but it's obviously the only space I know and I love occupying it. And I hope that, you know, if I have the calling it courage sounds so funny because I have so much joy doing it and there, there's, I have, I couldn't imagine doing anything else, but like, you know, other women, like they'll be like, you know, seeing you like, just do you so hard and like be the truest version of yourself makes me want to be the truest version of myself. That's everything. Right. That's everything. So, you know, just sort of, living in that space and celebrating life as a woman and as whoever the fuck you are. I think that's the best thing ever. Well, everybody, it's a wrap. And I hope you enjoy my conversation with Karina as much as I did. I hope that it just lifted your spirits and energy the way that it did mine after we spoke on that Sunday afternoon. Make sure to give her a follow on all of her socials at Karina Reichman. Check out her tour calendar. You will not regret seeing her live. It's definitely something to behold. And I can't wait to hear her debut album. But to keep up with me on my socials, follow me at I am Maggie Rose. And give me a follow on With The Band if you want some exclusive Salute The Songbird content, some live stream concerts, and more. And please check out my tour calendar. You can hear it in my voice. I've been singing so much and out on the road and having a blast, but we're so happy live music is back and we want to see you guys out there. Please subscribe to Salute the Songbird on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast content. And if you like the show, recommend it to a friend or leave us a review so that others can join the conversation. Thanks so much for listening. Salute the Songbird is brought to you by Osiris Media, hosted by Maggie Rose, produced by Austin Marshall, Maggie Rose, and Kirsten Cluthy, with production assistance from Grace Romer and Kip Young. Music by Maggie Rose. Show logo by Premier Music Group. Graphics by Catherine Boyles and Mark Dowd. Thank you so much for listening, and to close out the show, here's Dirty South from Karina Reichman.
Osiris.